This X-Men roster we're about to talk about marked the return of Chris Claremont to the X-Men in a full-time capacity. Extreme X-Men Volume 1 is a series that started in 2001 and ran till 2004. It was a team that featured my girl Rogue as leader, you know I'm all about Rogue. The original Extreme X-Men roster also featured Beast, Psylocke, Bishop, Storm, Sage, and Thunderbird on the team. Lifeguard, Gambit, and Slipstream were also added to the mix throughout. Honestly, I love Lifeguard and I don't think she gets enough love. This team was originally brought together to find Destiny's premonition-filled diaries, but of course, along the way, was distracted by many other imminent threats. As you do. The Great Ring of Arako is exclusively made up of Omega level mutants, which really tells you how much of a powerhouse team they would be. They are the ruling body of Arako, which is the sister mutant island nation to Krakoa, which of course eventually goes on to become Mars, and yeah, we've had a whole adventure with them. In fact, Arako and Krakoa are actually less siblings and are more romantically tied in terms of the islands themselves. They're both sentient mutant islands, and for a long time they were attached to one another and also uh, kind of in Love, although now they prefer to be separate. They tried to be reunited after Arako was liberated, but then uh, they just weren't feeling it at that time. You know how it is. Arako's ruling government has four distinct sections which govern different parts of their civilization, with some areas having more power at given times. For example, in war times, Dawn is the area that typically gets more say, as this is the area that would rule and govern during that time. For years, the Iraqi were at war with the men, so this would have been a very prominent section for many years in their history. And it's something that the mutants of Arako struggle with releasing themselves from, the obligation to always be on guard and always be at war. While Uranos faced off with the Great Ring of Arako and uh, pretty much cleaned their clock, pretty recently actually, this should not make us undermine their strength, as Uranos is basically on a whole other level by himself as one of the most powerful, ruthless, and evil Eternals that we've ever seen in comics, so yeah. Not all teams on my list here are going to be the good guys when it comes to our X-Men rosters. And this is, uh, this is one of those teams. It was simply too good for me to not include. And the fantastic Extreme X-Men, this is a team of villains from alternate realities, and even perhaps the main reality that our multiversal X-Men team, led by Earth-616's Dazzler, must face. The 10 Evil Xaviers features one that is a cowboy, another that is a Cthulhu-like floating brain, and one that is a giant Akanti whale, and so many more amazing weird alternates of the X-Men men's leader and mentor, Charles Xavier, aka Professor X. This one is from the 2010 series Generation Hope and was under Cyclops' banner ultimately following the events of Regenesis. Though the team itself was led by mutant Messiah Hope Summers and its roster consisted of No Girl, Pixie, Primal, Sebastian Shaw, Transonic, Velocidad, and Zero at that time. Though originally Hope's team started pre-Regenesis as just being five mutants, including Hope herself as one of those five, with Velocidad, Oya, Primal, and Transonic on the team. The team was sort of brought together as a search and rescue group who were acknowledged as the four of the five lights of Cerebra. Hope basically triggered the rebirth of the mutant gene, activating these mutants, and the fifth light was what they sought and why they basically came together, heading to Tokyo, Japan to find out this fifth light. Zero was the mutant they sought, who would of course eventually join the team. While everyone might focus on the battle of the Adam Future Brotherhood team, as Ray's has, you know, a tendency to seal the show, we all love Ray's, plus my girl Zoran Jean, and also featuring Molly Hayes, people tend to forget about the awesomeness that was the future X-Men team as well, the real future X-Men. This team featured a much more skilled Iceman, who now was known as Ice Wizard, Wiccan, who had become Sorcerer Supreme at this point, Chimera, who is believed to be Storm's daughter that she had with Black Panther, Shogo, Jubilee's son, known as Sentinel X, Colossus, armed with Magic Soul Sword, Kid Omega as Phoenix, and Jubilee as Wolverine. I kind of love all of this. Jubilee is Wolverine's a little weird, but I'm still kind of into it because, yeah, Jube's following in Wolverine's footsteps is super cute. The Dark X-Men are what we get when Norman Osborn is basically put in charge of all the super teams you can imagine. And yes, as I said, not everyone on my list is going to be a good X-Men team, because that's not as much fun. I love a little bit of evil sprinkled in. Now this team came out of the Dark Reign period over at Marvel Comics. Norman ended up becoming the world's greatest hero, at least in civilians and the government's eyes, after he successfully shot and killed Skrull Queen Veronica in essence ending secret wars and in a weird twist saving the day. Not what you'd expect from Norman, but there we were. As a reward, he was given the task of creating a new organization to take over for the disbanded shield. Norman created Hammer in response and made his own teams of both Dark Avengers and 
Dark X-Men. His initial roster included Dark Beast, Mystique, Mimic, and Omega. I feel like Dark Beast is such a great evil mutant that he generally just ends up being on almost every evil mutant X-Men team. But also, I love Dark Beast, so I'm kind of fine with that. Although to be fair, Hank was giving him a run for his money recently when we had the previous incarnation of Hank as the main continuity one in the X-Men. And I wish Dark Beast was still alive though, so I at least had some way to rationally explain that whole version of Hank's behavior. Who I thought might have been Dark Beast for a while, but then considering that Dark Beast is dead and everything else, and we also see proof of that. That, yeah, sadly that was not the case. Spider-Man's special class is a great and overall underrated team. They were pulled together as the result of Storm finding some papers belonging to Logan after his death, mentioning the intention to put together a special class of mutants for Spider-Man to teach, made up of kids who were deemed most likely to become villains. <laughs> Which honestly for some of these some of these people, I can't believe that he's like these people. <laughs> they could become villains. They could become villains, bub. They go on a couple of adventures together, but tragically wouldn't last too long as a team, but I just love the idea of Spider-Man teaching a group of mutants. The team included Ernst, No Girl, Rockslide, Hellion, Shark Girl, Glob Herman, and Eye Boy, with quite a few of these younger mutants being some of my favorites. See if you can guess who is among them in the comments, and share with me some of your favorite mutants, please. The Extinction team truly is a scary one. They came together in response to the fact that the Phoenix Force was believed to be returning. It was thought that the Phoenix Force wanted to merge with mutant Messiah Hope Summers and have her act as its host. While the X-Men were more optimistic about the Phoenix's return, the Avengers were not so much. As a result, the mutants deployed their own team to fight against the Avengers, but which was initially also created to defend the mutant island of Utopia and the world against extinction level threats, hence the name. Extinction Team. The Extinction Team included Cyclops, Magneto, Namor, Storm, Danger, Magic, Hope Summers, Emma Frost, and Colossus. Now, that, talk about a powerhouse lineup. That's wild. Never mind the Phoenix Force. This team, in and of itself, seems frightening enough to justify the Avengers' concern. If these mutants all got together and I was on the Avengers, I would also be worried. Assuming they don't trust the mutants having power, too. Which, yeah. Which, while at times both teams have been allied, has always seemed to remain a bit of a touchy subject to the Avengers, who kind of have a history of not playing well with other major superhero teams in the Marvel Universe. In fact, they also even have a history of not playing well with each other within their own team. So, yeah. This team is what I like to call the other XSC. This team also spiraled out of a team that we talked about previously, Extreme X-Men. XSC here stands for the Extreme Sanctions Executive. Similar to the original XSC that Bishop was a part of in the future, this team is also like a military police force meant to maintain, and in some cases by force, ensure peace is kept between mutants and humans. By force. Storm was asked to create the team by the United Nations and eventually would increase its numbers by recruiting the rest of the X-Men, making this another government sanctioned mutant team, kind of like X-Factor was, or at least, you know, X-Factor was to start. Team members have included Bishop, Cannonball, Magma, Rachel Summers, Psylocke, Rogue, Sage, Wolverine, X-23, and Gambit. What a fun team. I think it's such a fun team. I mean, when you consider that the sword bearers of Arako were all pretty much kicking the champions of Krakoa's butts, we have to put them on this list, right? I mean, it's just too, it's just too cool. While the Iraqi are newer when it comes to the mutant status quo and what we consider to be an X-Men team, considering we, you know, are just getting to know them still, they've still, they're still pretty new to the canon, and they're loosely tied to the X-Men through both their connection to Apocalypse and of course all being mutant, at the end of the day, they are still mutants, and I personally think we could kind of see them as X-Men, you know what I mean? Or at least X-Men adjacent, and for that reason, I think that we can include them on this list, which is really more about, you know, mutant teams than I would say specifically X-Men sister teams or X-Men X-Men rosters, I'm kind of keeping it a little bit more general here because there's just so many cool X-based teams. We just use the name X-Men because, you know, it makes more sense in relation to Marvel Mutants and it's more appealing than if we put, you know, Marvel Mutants in the title of this video. It's more clickable, you dig? The sword bearers of Arako didn't just best their Krakoan competitors in contests of combat and wit, but also in some of the more charismatic and honestly odd contests during the Ten of Swords or Otherworld tournament. Also beating them in a dancing competition, a runway model one, and a scavenger hunt to name a few of those seen in X-Force issue number 14 of the 2019 series. Now, 
When we say that these teams deserve better, there really isn't a better example than the Harvesters. After the events of the Superhuman Civil War, Iron Man created the 50 State Initiative. This was essentially an initiative to set up government funded superhero teams throughout each of the United States. Some of these teams were already established groups of heroes, but for some states, completely new groups composed of local heroes were formed. The Sunflower State, Kansas, gained its team in the form of the Harvesters. This new new team was made up of pretty strange heroes that we hadn't seen before. Topeka, who led the team, was basically just a super soldier. Then there was Pioneer, who had the power of the planes, as she put it. Sunflower, who was literally a human sunflower who got stronger under direct sunlight and appeared to have a high degree of durability. There was Meadowlark, who could fly and sing to hypnotize people. And then, of course, there was Grain Belt, whose body was literally made of grain that he could control. Why did they deserve better? Well, this this team's only claim to fame came when they faced off against a zombie clone of the hero Hyperion, who is basically the Marvel equivalent of Superman, and he utterly destroyed each member of this team. They did not stand a single chance. Only Pioneer just barely made it out alive by raising up an entire herd of undead cattle and trampling the zombie Hyperion, who then succumbed to mad cow disease, and I wish I made that up. Now most of you nerds have heard about the Skrulls. This alien race has been a nuisance in Marvel Comics ever since their first appearance in Fantastic Four number two. The Skrull members who fought the Four at this time ended up hypnotized into believing they were actually cows by Reed Richards and they shapeshifted into and were stuck as cows. What I'm sure Reed did not anticipate is that these Skrull cows ended up finding themselves in a butcher and turned into beef. This Skrull beef was then consumed by regular old Earthlings. Now, while a good majority of people did not survive the Skrull cow meat, a select few did, and had the Skrull's adaptable DNA code transferred into their human cells, resulting in a condition called Skrullivoria induced Skrullophobia. The infected individuals gained the ability to shape shift like a Skrull, but also developed an intense irrational fear and hatred of the Skrull. And they came together to form the aptly named Skrull Kill Crew. Fueled by their irrational impulses to destroy the Skrull, they helped prevent the Skrulls from attacking other people, but they even faced off against other villains like Baron Von Strucker. It's just a really unfortunate way to gain a superpower. Now, X-Force is the awesome Black Ops X-Men related team with characters like Domino and Cable and Cannonball and Wolverine and Warpath, and it's awesome. But for a short little while, it was decidedly not awesome. In the year 2000, X-Force got canceled and rebranded into what eventually would become X-Statics. This team isn't exactly one of the premier mutant teams in the world, and that's putting it lightly. The original team was made up of the mutants Zeitgeist, who has the power of Super Puke, La Nui with Dark Force powers, Battering Ram, who was a big purple goat looking man, Plasm, who had liquidy water powers, Gin Genie, who could create earthquakes depending on how much she drank, and Sluck, who was basically a squid man. But all of those original members, minus three of them who I didn't mention, and Sluck, who was blown up by a tank in South Africa, all got completely decimated in spectacularly embarrassing fashion during a rescue mission to save a pop music boy band named Boys Are Us. Turns out their demise was actually planned by the team's manager, coach, and its leader, Zeitgeist, because they thought a team with a constantly changing roster and high body count would gain them fan interest. Interest. The team managed to go on with pretty horrible results. There have been 28 members of Ecstatics who have passed away over their history with only 9 surviving. 9. Okay, so we have Ecstatics, we have X-Force, we have the X-Men of course, and we have a whole handful of other X-branded teams, but some mutants aren't considered presentable to the outside world because whatever their mutation is, it has been deemed either gross or terrifying by the wider Marvel human society, or they are mutants who are just bitter about being persecuted for being mutants. This group banded together, named themselves the Morlocks, and headed down into the Morlock tunnels beneath New York City. Already without anything happening to them other than their mutations, these characters have it rough and deserve better. But then, to add flame to the fire, the Morlocks undergo tragedy after tragedy after tragedy, with one of the worst being the event known as the Mutant Map where Mr. Sinister and the mutant Gambit put together a group of villainous characters and led them into the tunnels to commit, well, a massacre. 
And it was all because another villain, Dark Beast, created some of these Morlocks and Mr. Sinister didn't like that. Sometimes it takes the smallest of things to bring people together. And while that may sound like an extremely beautiful sentiment, I'm saying it in relation to the villainous team known as the Headmen, who it seems came together because each of their powers revolves around their heads in one way or another. And it's honestly kind of unsettling in my opinion. Putting their heads together, figuratively, not literally, these scientists sought out world domination, bringing them into conflict with the Defenders, She-Hulk, and Spider-Man. The quartet consisted of Arthur Nagin, their leader who had his head transplanted onto the body of a gorilla, Ruby Thursday who replaced her own head with an organic computer capable of changing shape, Gerald Morgan aka Shrunken Bones who accidentally shrank his own skeleton including his skull so he basically just had really baggy skin, and Chandu the mystic's head had been transplanted by Nagin onto a number of different bodies throughout his time making him quite the versatile little guy. Not gonna lie. The champions of Los Angeles were the first West Coast based superhuman team. They formed like all great superhero teams do with several heroes happening to just meet by chance against a great threat. In this case, that threat took the form of the Greek god of death, Pluto. The group consisted of two former X-Men, Angel and Iceman, the Greek god of strength, Hercules who I swear is super underappreciated, Johnny Blaze, the original Ghost Rider, and the Russian spy Black Widow who led the team. After defeating Pluto, the champions of Los Angeles, or just the champions, decided to stick together as a team. Warren Worthington III aka Angel was the wealth behind the group and with his money they bought their own Quinjet and named it the Champ Jet, which I find hilarious because over time, the members of this team started to become embarrassed by the entire idea of the team as a whole. Both Iceman and Angel called it an embarrassment and a nightmare because they had no idea what they were doing. But still, they had a few more adventures working with X-Force and they had some additions to the roster with Black Goliath who aided the team in a scientific aspect and another Russian female hero, Darkstar, who was originally there to capture Black Widow but ended up changing sides instead. I'm gonna be honest, I kinda love the lineup of this team, I'd read it if they came back. Now you remember how the headmen all came together based on their head related powers? Well I'll do you one better. How about the death throws, whose powers and names all have something to do with commonly throwing stuff. The leader, ringleader, threw together teammates Bombshell, Knick Knack, Oddball, Tenpin, and Throwdown into a group that honestly works really well together, juggling their various different throwing instruments between each other. They worked so well together in fact that they were even hired to and succeeded in breaking the villain Crossfire out of prison. However, once they had taken Crossfire to their HQ, they discovered that Crossfire was broke. His assets had all been impounded and he had lost all of his useful connections. These guys did battle with characters like Captain America, Crossfire, Hawkeye, and even Loki of all people who stopped the group from robbing the big top casino in Las Vegas. Their Marvel wiki even lists their origins as, and I quote, a joint effort to perform criminal and mercenary acts while using juggling expertise. I honestly can't even believe this group of villains exists and that they haven't been able to get bullseye into their ranks. What the heck's up with that? Okay, of all the teams on this list, I think that Horticulture may be my favorite. For starters, they look so cool, but then you find out that it's actually just a bunch of older women between the ages of 64 to 81 who are all expert botanists and want to bring Earth back to a more pristine time when it had about 7 billion less people on it and it was ruled by plant life. I just love how they use their regular names and the names just kind of suit their ages and interests in plants. We got Augusta Bromes, Lily Lamus, Edith Scutch, and Opal Vetiver. Gosh! What a bunch of winners. But yes, that's right, these ladies want to basically exterminate most of the Earth's human population and bring plants back to the forefront, specifically flowers. This goal brings them into conflict with the X-Men in 2019's X-Men number three. Beyond biological modifications believed to have been made to themselves, the women of horticulture are experts at manipulating the environment to suit their extinction agenda, and they're also computer programmers selling software to Orcus to monitor Krakoan gateways. They did get pretty handily walloped though, so hmm. Second to last, as part of kid-centric star comics, Marvel decided 
decided to release a team composed of animal superheroes, which is cool. But the difference here is this team of animal heroes were cybernetically enhanced super intelligent animals with absolutely massive arsenals and awesome exoskeletons, which is much cooler. And they fought for the environment, which is even cooler cooler. This team was made up of Boomer, a kangaroo, Lionheart, a lion, Soar slash Slipstream, an eagle, Reckless, who was a bear, and Dr. Echo slash Surfstreak, who was a dolphin. Does it sound kind of ridiculous? Sure, but it is awesome. This team was co-created by Multicore, spearheaded by Dr. Randall Pierce, and it was all part of Weapons 2, which itself was the second project after Weapon 1. Who would have thought? Also known as Project Rebirth, also known as the project that created Captain America. Now some of you may know that these projects were part of a bigger thing called Weapons Plus, who would eventually go on to create Man-Thing, Luke Cage, Nuke, Typhoid Mary, Phantom X, the Stepford Cuckoos, and of course, Wolverine. So most people know that they aren't exactly a good group of people. While their original series was cancelled after only a few issues in Wolverine and Captain America Weapons Plus number one, those two heroes investigated an abandoned Weapons Plus site where they found the team kept in hibernation tanks full of liquid. The bear, Reckless, was freed from his container but attacked the duo resulting in his passing. And last up today, first ever introduced in 1989's West Coast Avengers Volume 2 number 46, the Great Lake Avengers formed after Mr. Immortal put out an ad in the local personals seeking men and women of action to join forces and form a team of super friends. This managed to catch the attention of Avengers members Hawkeye and Mockingbird. In order to help them out, the Great Lakes Avengers were trained by the duo and the rest was history. The team is made up of pretty much Z-list heroes with the main lineup usually consisting of Mr. Immortal, Doorman, Big Bertha, and Flatman. Naturally, as a sort of running joke throughout Marvel Comics since their introduction, the team goes up against some of the zaniest villains and situations I have ever seen, and they don't do particularly well. But I'll be darned if I don't have a soft spot for this team. The funny thing about most joke characters and teams is that they almost always end up actually doing some pretty extraordinary things from time to time. Back in 2009, Mr. Fantastic of the Fantastic Four takes a little trip to the inhuman city of Adelan, searching for the Infinity Gems. The massive teleporting inhuman bulldog Lockjaw happens to stumble on the mind gem and is granted telepathy. Using this telepathy to read Mr. Fantastic's mind, he decides to use his other power to go and round up the other gems. Along the way, Lockjaw runs into Hairball the cat belonging to Speedball, the dragon Lockheed, the companion of Kitty Pride, Red Wing, Falcon's pet Falcon, Throg, a frog with the powers of Thor, Zabu, the saber toothed tiger ally of the Savage Lands Kazar, and Miss Lion, May Parker's dog. Despite the fact that this team are literally just super pets, they decide to team up as the Pet Avengers and they go off to assemble the Infinity Gems as part of a four part limited series. A more recent Earth 616 version of the team from 2021 consisted of Lockjaw, Throg, and Lockheed still, but this time accompanied by Doctor Strange's ghost dog Bats and Hugin and Munin. The Ravens of Thor, formerly belonging to Odin. This X-Men team and roster, the Extreme X-Men, marked the return of Chris Claremont to the X-Men in a full-time capacity. Extreme X-Men Volume 1 is a series that started in 2001 and ran until 2004. It was a team that featured my girl Rogue as leader, who is soon going to be the leader of the X-Men again, or a X-Men team, which you know, I'm all about because I love Rogue. The original Extreme X-Men roster features Beast, Psylocke, Bishop, Storm, Sage, and Thunderbird. Lifeguard, Gambit, and Slipstream were also added into the mix throughout the series. This team was originally brought together to find Destiny's premonition-filled diaries, but of course, along the way was distracted by many other imminent threats as happens when you're an X-Men team. There have been several incarnations of the Outsiders in DC Comics, and most have been Batman or Batman family related, with one team even being led by Nightwing. The first ever version of the team came in 1983 after Batman gained a rather uncomfortable standing with the Justice League. The team had some notable moments, particularly because of its new characters like Katana and Geoforce. Batman and the Justice League would patch things up, and so he left the team to continue operating without him. During that time, they were operating in Markovia in order to receive funding and then moved to Los Angeles before they reunited with Batman and gained access to a Los Angeles Batcave. The last version of the team came following Batman Rip in 2008, where Alfred put together the team with each member representing a part of Batman's legacy, but obviously Batman actually never really bites the dust permanently, so that didn't really last. 
Cape Sync is a superhero team, or really a superhero agency, I guess I should say, from the same world as Invincible. In fact, as early on as issue number eight of the Invincible series, you can see some of their members featured in the background. Not only that, but they also ended up getting their own spin off comic as well. Although I believe it only lasted three issues total. It was a mini series. You know, that's how it goes sometimes. Though there were Cape Sync backup stories, I believe, in certain issues of Invincible as well. So if you really like it, you can also check those out, which also told the team's story. The mini series centered initially initially around Bolt, who welcomes a new recruit to the team as his partner. The team is more like a business and kind of seems to operate kind of like a super powered police station or a police office. People even get paid and everything. Kid Thor is the new kid in town who joins up with Bolt. Bolt, we learn initially, wanted his name to be Black Samson, but obviously that name was already taken by um, the Guardians of the Globe members. So alas, it was unavailable when he joined up with Cape Sink, and that's why he's Bolt. The team known as Force Works was formed by Iron Man, who had left the Avengers due to a dispute as to the role of superhumans. Force Works maintained the outlook that rather than being a reactionary force, they should try to preempt both natural and man made disasters. The team was initially composed of Iron Man, US Agent, Spider Woman, Julian Carpenter, Scarlet Witch, and Wonder Man, which, in my opinion, is such an interesting group of heroes. But by the end of their first mission, Wonder Man was thought to be deceased at the hands of the invading Kree, and shortly after, the alien sentry took his place, only to be completely forgotten when the team disbanded. The team fought in several skirmishes, but really only lasted about two years. The characters were mainly reabsorbed into the ranks of the Avengers afterwards. I like to refer to this next one as the other XSE team. This team also spiraled out of a team that we talked about previously on this list, Extreme X-Men. XSE here stands for the Extreme Sanctuary. Executive. Similar to the original XSE that Bishop was a part of in the future, or in his future, this team is also like a military police force, meant to maintain and in some cases enforce peace is kept between mutants and humans. Storm was asked to create the team by the United Nations and eventually would increase its numbers by recruiting the rest of her X-Men, making this another government sanctioned mutant team like X-Factor was originally. Team members have included Bishop, Cannonball, Magma, Rachel Summers, Psylocke, Rogue, Sage, Wolverine, X-23, and Gambit. Now that that's a team. Look, even though the book was cancelled in 1978 after a mere 17 issues and many people including the heroes on the team look at it as an embarrassment, the champions roster was actually pretty darn capable. With a team of two founding X-Men, Iceman and Angel, combined with heavy hitters Hercules, the Spirit of Vengeance Ghost Rider, and being led by Natasha Romanov, Black Widow, the champions were aptly named and could kick some serious butt when given the opportunity. The team fought familiar villains like Titanic. Titanium Man and the Griffin, but even began to develop their own rogues gallery with new villains such as Rampage and Swarm. And they even got an addition to the team in the form of Black Goliath before the book was cancelled. The team was intended to reform in 2007, only they were forced to rename as The Order since Marvel had lost the trademark for the champions over the years. You've heard of Green Lanterns, maybe you've even heard of Yellow Lanterns or Red Lanterns or even Black Lanterns, but how about Blue Lanterns? Yeah, that's a color too. Blue Lanterns have only made a few appearances in the new continuity, and even before that, during the New Earth days of DC, they weren't necessarily the most frequent to appear. Mainly, I feel like people just know Green Lanterns, whose color, of course, represents willpower. To be a Green Lantern, you must be strong in will. So, what's blue about? What's the whole blue thing? To be a Blue Lantern, you must be full of hope. <laughs> So beautiful. I feel like I could be a Blue Lantern, honestly. If Green Lanterns are like the intergalactic police, Blue Lanterns are like therapists or peacekeepers or priests, maybe. They have long been allies to the Green Lanterns, and their powers actually provide a boost to fellow Green Lanterns when they're nearby. Pretty cute. This is because their whole focus is of course on belief and hope, having faith in those around them. As such, many of their names start with a title like Saint, Sister, or Brother. I'd definitely be Sister. Sister Amanda, Blue Lantern. Sister McKnight. Kind of like the champions, DC's Detroit League is another team that gets a real bad rap, but actually has a pretty stacked roster when you take a closer inspection. After Aquaman, a charter member of the original Justice League, decided that the Justice League members were too interested in their own individual problems to be part of an effective team, he used his position to disband the team and establish the Detroit League. This new team with half old timers and half newbies was largely used to add some diversity to the DC heroic lineup. 
Whether it achieved that or not is up to the reader. Made up of League mainstays like Martian Manhunter, Aquaman, Zaytana, and Elongated Man, along with newbies like Vibe, Gypsy, Vixen, and Commander Steel, it's often considered the worst roster of the team, but if you actually look at the roster and do some critical thinking, you'll find that it's very powerful indeed. Martian Manhunter and Zaytana alone are absolute powerhouses. Despite the jokes, Aquaman or even Commander Steel both make really effective tanks and the rest of the team is quite capable in a variation of different situations. The God Squad is about as powerful as they sound, but they still remain one of the lesser known teams in the Marvel Universe. The team was originally assembled by the Council of Godheads and first came together during the events of Secret Invasion. The team first formed in The Incredible Hercules issue number 117 in 2008. The original roster included Adam the Demogorge, Snowbird, the Eternal Ajax, and Amatsu Mikiboshi, later known as, of course, the Chaos King. The roster would go on to include such impressive members as Silver Surfer, Galactus, Circe, Thor, Amadeus Cho, and of course, Hercules himself. Number 10. Sisterhood of the Slight Hand Sisterhood of the Slight Hand has only made a few appearances in the comics, so they're not as much of a superhero team as they are, um, I guess, a collective of witches, but I feel like most of the witches are good among them, or at least neutral, so I figured it would be safe to count them. Also, I believe in general as a group they're a force of good, so even those that are part of the group that aren't as good, that the whole group is supposed to be good, okay? Prominent, but still somewhat obscure members include Tracy 13, Enchantress, Manitou Dawn, and Witchfire. I love Witchfire. When, when will I get my Witchfire series? And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not click that subscribe button so you don't miss out on any good old nerdy content. I know there's a lot of people out there that don't subscribe, so if that's you, I'm talking to you. Number 9. Justice League Dark. Everyone's heard of the Justice League, but who the heck is Justice League Dark? And why do they sound like they're a supervillain team? Well, while their name might make them sound like they are up to no good, the opposite could not actually be more true. They are a more covert division of the Justice League, actually, an offshoot that primarily works in the shadows to help stop more unseen magic threats. In fact, when they saved the universe from Hecate's influence, the Justice League wasn't even aware of what was going on at the time. Because Hecate just didn't want the Justice League to be aware of her, so they simply just weren't. And that was a threat to the entire universe, friends. They deal with threats that the Justice League honestly might be ill-equipped to face. And one of their members is actually a core member of the JLA team, Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman initially acts as a team leader, and the team has included Zatanna, John Constantine, Detective Chimp, Dr. Fates, both Khalid Nazur, and also for a little while, Kent Nelson, Madame Xanadu, Animal Man, Dead Man, Ragman, all the men, really, Etrigan and Jason Blood, and a slew of others who are more magically inclined. It's a big list, but that's some of them. <laughs> Number 8. Exiles The Exiles are probably the most potentially well known of the ones that I've listed here, but if you are new to comics or more of a casual fan, this one for you will probably be something that you don't know about, which is why I put it here, because I want you to know. For those who don't know the Exiles, they're a super cool team with a long ongoing series. They're actually a multiversal superhero team made up of various alternate versions of superheroes from across the multiverse. Because anyone from any other Earth can be a member of the team, there are a lot of people who have been on the roster over the years, members who have come and gone, or even died during their time on the team. The very first team to appear though in Exiles, the first roster that appeared in Exiles, Volume 1, issue number 1, out of 2001, a lot of ones, featured a slew of alternate reality versions of characters, including an alternate version of Blink from Age of Apocalypse Reality, Earth number 295, Nocturne, the daughter of Scarlet Witch and Nightcrawler in an alternate reality, Thunderbird of Earth 1100, Mimic of Earth 12, an alternate version of everyone's favorite fun-loving mutant Morph from Earth 1081, and an alternate version of Magneto, simply known as Magnus from Earth 27. So many cool multiverse folks. Number 7. Blue Lanterns You've heard of Green Lanterns, maybe you've even heard of Yellow Lanterns or Red Lanterns or Black Lanterns, but how about Blue Lanterns? Blue Lanterns have only made a few appearances in the new continuity, and even before that, during the New Earth days of DC, they weren't necessarily the most frequent to appear. Mainly, I feel like people know Green Lanterns, whose color represents willpower. To be a Green Lantern, you must be strong in will. To be a Blue Lantern, though, you must be full of hope, strong in hope. <laughs> if Green Lanterns are like the intergalactic police, Blue Lanterns are kind of like, I guess, the therapists or the peacekeepers or maybe the priests. 
that's accurate based on their naming. They have long been allies to the Green Lanterns and their powers actually provide a boost to fellow Green Lanterns when they are nearby. This is because their whole focus is on belief and hope, having faith in those around them. As such, many of their names start with uh, titles like Saint, Sister, or Brother. Number 6. Hellions While they were recent, the fact remains that the Hellions were a pretty short lived team. Now if you're new to the channel, first of all, hello, welcome in, happy to have you. As I said, click the subscribe. And also, you probably aren't familiar with the Hellions. Those who have been here for a while, regardless of whether they read the book or were not, will know the team I'm talking about though, because I do like to talk about them. Sure, there might be many out there who know of Emma Frost's Hellions team in their striking pink suits, but how many know about Nathaniel Essex aka Mr. Sinister's Hellions team? Sounds like it should be a villain team again. Right? Well, oddly enough, it isn't. This team was made up of the rejected members of Krakoan Mutant Society, who were put together on their own team with the hope of rehabilitating the mutants and helping them to find a place in society, while also allowing more put together mutants to keep a kind of a closer eye on them, I guess. Minus Mr. Sinister, who they did put in charge of this team for some reason. <laughs> Goodness. This was also at a time where pretty much all mutants were kind of considered to be like, Good. However, I still feel like letting Sinister run this team was a huge oversight. That is part of the reason that I wanted to read the series though, and I was honestly not disappointed with this series. The team includes Quanin as Psylocke, Havoc, Wildchild, Nanny, Orphan Maker, John Greycrow, and former Hellion Empath. The team only lasted as long as their series, and afterward, they disbanded, and it was really sad. Number 5. Capes Inc. Capes Inc. is another superhero team from the same world as Invincible. In fact, as early on as issue number 8 of the Invincible series, you can see some of their members featured in the background. Not only that, but they also ended up getting their own spin off comic as well, although I believe it only lasted like a few issues, three I think to be exact. The series centered initially around Bolt, who welcomes a new recruit to the team as his partner. The team is more like a business and kind of seems to operate like kind of like a super powered <laughs> police station or office. It's like Bolt has this partner and they drive around and like fight crime. People even get paid and everything. Kid Thor is the new kid in town who ends up joining with Bolt. Bolt we learned originally actually wanted to be known as Black Samson, but obviously that name was already taken by the Guardians of the Globe hero. Oh man, there's just so many little bits in this that are pretty hilarious. Number 4. A-Force A-Force is a team that I love, but not one that many people talk about I find. I feel like a lot of people forget that this happened. It's probably because, you know, we haven't seen seen A Force in some time. But when they were around, they were pretty great. But also quite short lived even more so than the Hellions. A-Force at least appeared in a few other comics other than their own series, but they had a considerably shorter run for their own series. Despite their team honestly being really stacked and it sounding like, I don't know, just sounded like a really great team. I'm surprised it didn't go longer. Members included She-Hulk, who led the team, Captain Marvel, Dazzler, an alternate reality version of Dazzler, who is Thor, Nico Minoru, Singularity, and Queen Medusa. Number 3. God Squad God Squad was one that I was hoping to see a nod to in Thor Love and Thunder. I was hoping that when we went to Olympus, we might get a peek at some version of this team. Maybe not one for one, but it could have been cool to see the team acknowledged with maybe even a different take on it. I just really love the name, God Squad. This was a group of heroes and gods who were assembled to fight against the Skrull Pantheon, brought together by Athena. The team included Hercules as leader, Circe and Ajax of the Eternals, Thor, Silver Surfer, Galactus, Venus, Amadeus Cho, Snowboard, Snowboard? Board. Snowbird. Snowboard, what would that hero be? Just someone that snowboards, I guess. Amadeus Cho, Snowbird, Amatsu Mikiboshi, and Adam. Number two, Justice League Queer. Justice League Queer has made fewer appearances than I have fingers on this here hand. They're less of a superhero group and more of a support group for other prominent superheroes who are queer. And honestly, I kind of love that. Although I'm sure they do still team up and fight crime. But they're also mainly about advocating for LGBTQIA rights. This team made their first appearance in the 2020 2021 issue of DC Pride. They also popped up in 2023 DC Pride and in a holiday special as well. The team or group is led by Extraño, a powerful magic based superhero who was the first out and proud soup. He created the group to make sure others out there never felt alone as he had initially. And I love it. Number 1. 6. You might have heard of the Krakoan 5, but do you know of 
the Six. The Six, or just Six, are a team of primarily teleportation based mutant heroes who were recruited by Abigail Brand to be part of her new mutant based sword team, when that was a thing. While the team is called the Six, there are actually more than six members. The Six refers to the core members who are the teleportation based mutants, while the other members are also integral to the mission statement of the team, which is all about further expansion and exploration of the possibilities of mutant technology. The team has included Abigail Brand, Magneto, Manifold, Armor, Cora of the Burning Heart, Wizkid, Peeper, Fabian Cortez, Risque, Gateway, Lila Cheney, Blink, Amelia Vaught, and Vanisher. The team also has backup members on call in case they need to swap folks out as well, especially for teleporters. Which, to be fair, there are a lot of mutant teleporters, so that makes sense. Coming in at number 10 today is the Asgardians of the Galaxy. The Guardians of the Galaxy never used to be the most popular team until the MCU brought them to theaters and now almost everyone knows of the Guardians. But what most people don't know about is the Asgardians of the Galaxy. The Asgardians of the Galaxy were a team of Asgardian and Earthbound Asgardian related misfits assembled by the hero Angela secretly on behalf of Kid Loki. The team consisted of Thunderstrike, aka Kevin Masterson, the son of the original Eric Masterson Thunderstrike, who once stood in for Thor in the 90s, Scourge the Executioner, the guy obsessed with Enchantress, Throg, yes, that is the frog version of Thor, who is normally chilling out on a lily pad in Central Park, and Valkyrie, along with her human host, Annabelle. Riggs. Now, pulled together in a tie in to the 2018 Infinity Wars event, their objective was to help Kid Loki retrieve the Naglfar beacon in anticipation of the upcoming War of the Realms waged by Malekith the Accursed. This put them into conflict with Nebula, who was using the beacon to lead an army of undead gods to bring about another Ragnarok. And if that sounds awesome, it's because it is. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not consider clicking that subscribe button? Number 9, Storm. Watch. I just found out this today, but apparently, when it comes to DC, there are actually a few different teams known as Stormwatch. Did you know that? One of them is actually a magic based team, which is probably even less known than the one I'm going to talk about. If we get to a part three, I'll tell you about that one. However, I figured Stormwatch from Wildstorm was still less known in comparison to stuff like, you know, the Justice League when we're talking DC. Who is Stormwatch in the Wildstorm universe before they came to DC? Well, initially, this was a team created by Jim Lee under his his imprint where he set out to create his own characters, which is different from what happens when you as a creator make things for DC and Marvel, where they basically retain the rights to everything you make. For Jim Lee, this proved to be a profitable choice as DC even later offered to buy Wildstorm from him. So he not only got to do, you know, everything on his own, which he got to own, but then also due to Wildstorm's success, he also got to sell the imprint back to DC after and make money on that deal, which is pretty great. That's some of the historical historical context for Stormwatch in regards to the imprint, but in regards to the canon history for this team, Stormwatch was initially brought together to basically combat alien incursions. The team however has been disbanded and reformed multiple times and they've also been known as a different name, one that might even be on this list. Prominent members have included Backlash, Jackson King, Jenny Sparks, Henry Bendix, Winter, multiple versions of D.Va, Fahrenheit, Apollo, Midnighter, Synergy, Nautica, and Deathblow to name a few. Later on, this team would be rebranded as something else that we'll talk about in a bit. Number 8, The Champions of Los Angeles. The Champions were the first West Coast based superhero team. They formed like all great superhero teams do, with several heroes happening to just meet by chance against one great threat. In this case, that threat took the form of the Greek god of death. Pluto. The group consisted of two former X-Men, Angel and Iceman, the Greek god of strength Hercules, who I swear is underappreciated, Johnny Blaze, the original Ghost Rider, and the Russian spy Black Widow, who became this team's leader. After defeating Pluto, the champions of Los Angeles, or just the champions, decided to stick together as a team. Warren Worthington III, aka Angel, was the wealth behind the team. They bought their own Quinjet and named it the Champ Jet, which I find hilarious because over time, the members of this team started to become embarrassed by the team, with both Iceman and Angel calling it an embarrassment and a nightmare because they had no idea what they were doing, apparently. But still, they had a few more adventures working with X-Force and they had some additions to the roster with Black Goliath, who aided the team in scientific endeavors from time to time, and another Russian female hero, Darkstar, who was originally there to capture Black Widow, but change sides instead. Number 7, Avengers. I know what you're thinking. Amanda, what? I know the Avengers. How could you not know the Avengers in 2023? Well, it's possible that you're not thinking of the same Avengers team 
that I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of the Avengers from Earth 1610, the original Ultimates reality. You see, while the Avengers did actually exist there, this team was actually very different from the version that we know that hails from the MCU or even the comics main reality of Earth 616. The Avengers team here was kind of treated more like a version of the Suicide Squad. They only made about 23 appearances total, and the roster was very different from what you'd be used to when you think of the mainstay Avengers in the main continuity. I mean, some of the same names, but totally different people. The team roster has included Black Widow, but this Black Widow was Monica Chang, the ex-wife of Nick Fury, a uh, yeah, Gregory Stark, Tony's evil twin brother in this reality, the Punisher, Nick Fury, Red Wasp, Tyrone Cash, a super interesting character, you should look him up, an evil version of Spider-Man created by Gregory Stark in a lab known as the Spider, an imitation of Thor known as Perun, Hawkeye, and War Machine. Basically, they're kind of like a rougher imitation Avengers. Number six, the Legion of Monsters. The Legion of Monsters is a team of monster-like characters who have vowed to protect other monsters like them that were hunted down to be killed or couldn't defend themselves. The team has consisted of characters like Sheikla, Werewolf by Night, Ghost Rider, Zombie, Elsa Bloodstone, Frankenstein's monster, Man-Thing, Morbius, Satana, the Living Mummy, and Manphibian, among others. Now, the original Legion of Monsters were united by chance when they each happened to investigate the appearance of a strange benevolent being called the Starseed, who came crashing to Earth. Starseed attempted to aid the monsters and cure them of their forms, even though, being monsters, they couldn't control themselves and attack Starseed. Because of the fear they caused him, when Man-Thing touched him, he bit the dust in Marvel Premiere number 28 from November 1975. One of the Legion's many missions included saving remaining monsters from the Hunter of Monster Special Force. They sent the monsters into the Morlock Tunnels and started a monster metropolis where the monsters could live in peace. They are the group that saved Frank Castle the Punisher and turned him into Frankencastle. Number 5, Teenage Kicks. You may have heard of this one thanks to the popular streaming series The Boys. It was the team that Popclaw from season 1 was on when she was a kid. The team is a pair of DC's Teen Titans and is a teenage superhero based team that was managed by Vought International. In the comics, they have a somewhat larger role in the story, but are still considered pretty much minor antagonists. Number four, The Authority. The Authority is a team that not a ton of people know about now. They were really popular and cool, but this team is going to be joining the DCEU under James Gunn's reboot. So before everyone and their moms hears about them, let's talk about them here. Now, for starters, The Authorities are not strictly a DC team. They are part of the Wildstorm universe of Earth-30, which we did talk about earlier, I believe. Here, metahumans are a bit more in control. They have no qualms against removing human political leadership if they engage in initiatives that harm others. Now, The initial roster consisted of hyper-skilled tactician Midnighter, who is basically like insane Batman, the Superman-esque solar-fueled powerhouse Apollo, the engineer whose blood consists of microscopic nanites, the winged warrior woman Swift, Jack Hawksmore, who draws superhuman abilities from cities, and the Doctor, a shaman connected to the energies of the Earth. Leading them was Jenny Sparks, the electrically powered spirit of the 20th century. Now They came together to protect the world by any means necessary, and they proved that. The Authority often used lethal measures to defeat their enemies and weren't above causing collateral damage to do so. They were actually the basis behind the evil supervillain team, the Elite, that Superman faced in What's So Funny, In Truth, Justice, and the American Way. But funnily enough, Superman even had his own version of the Authority team for a time. Number 3, Unofficial Dark X-Men. While the Dark X-Men were more of a thing during Norman Osborn's time in charge of the organization which replaced Shield, which he named Hammer during Dark Reign, there is also a new team of Dark X-Men that have appeared on the scene. Watch out, sound the alarms, new Dark X-Men. Although in the comics, they just go by the name of X-Men. There's no dark. But editorially, and in regards to the series they're featured in, they're known as the Dark X-Men. Which is why I'm giving that name to them unofficially. This team is also known as the Limbo-based X-Men, as their team leader is Madeline Pryor, the Goblin Queen, Jean Grey's once evil clone, and the current ruler of Limbo. Members include a Zero-possessed Albert, I love Albert, Emplate, Gambit, Faint, Havoc, Marrow, and Archangel. Although I think Archangel's no longer on the team right now. Number two, the Power Pack. The Power Pack were the four 
of Dr. James Power and Margaret Power. Now, their father, James, was in the process of creating an antimatter reactor that would supply the planet with clean energy, but also could potentially destroy the planet as well. On the night before the reactor was going to be tested, the four power kids, Alex, Julie, Jack, and Katie, had a run in with Alefire White Mane, aka Whitey, who was a member of the alien race known as the Chimelians. And he had crash landed not too far from the Powers' home and was not doing too hot. He told the kids about another alien race known as the Snarks, who were after the antimatter technology in order to destroy other planets. Now, as he passed away, he bestowed powers on the four kids. Alex became Zero G with the power to manipulate gravity. Julie became Light Speed with the powers of flight and acceleration. Jack became Mass Master with the ability to control the density of the molecules of his own body, and Katie became Energizer with the ability to disintegrate an object and absorb the released energy into herself, using it to project power balls of force from her chest. Other than facing Emperor Jakal and the snark species that he commanded, the Power Pack have teamed up with all kinds of heroes like Spider-Man, the X-Men, Cloak and Dagger, Devil Dinosaur, Gwenpool, Moon Girl, and Franklin and Valeria Richards in the Future Foundation. Number 1. Queen's Vengeance Queen's Vengeance is a reality warped version of the Avengers. This team was created when Morgan Le Fay ended up attacking the Avengers. As they prepared to strike back against her, Morgan Le Fay warped reality and ended up making the Avengers into members of her court, many of them becoming part of her trusted guard, the Queen's Vengeance, because reality was warped so that it was like basically the Middle Ages. The only member of the Avengers who was not transformed by the reality warp was Scarlet Witch, who actually could not be controlled this way. Wanda was held as a prisoner as such in Morgan Le Fay's dungeon, but managed to use her powers to reach out to her fellow Avengers, breaking the spell over Captain America's mind. Cap then sought out the other members of the team, and they managed to all wake up and rebel against Morgan Le Fay, reverting reality back to normal. At number 10 are the Titans. After the events of this year's Dark Crisis, which culminated in the disbandment of the Justice League, what? Superman, Wonder Woman, and Batman had a pep talk with Nightwing, wherein they basically tell him that it's time to straddle up and step up as the leader of a new team to protect the planet. The Teen Titans! I mean, no, not the Teen, just the Titans. Seems like the kiddos are all grown up now. And man, do they grow up fast. It's amazing what a lack of adjectives does to a name, right? Anywho, not only does this team bring back everybody from the original Teen Titans, including Beast Boy, Raven, Starfire, and Cyborg, but we've also got some newcomers like Wonder Girl and The Flash added into the roster. Personally, I was a huge fan of the original animated Teen Titans series, so, so to see the crew reunited after all these years just... Just brings a tear to my pie. At number nine is the new Avengers. The new Avengers roster this year is more stacked than it's ever been. It's pretty much the dream team. We've got, obviously, Tony Stark's Iron Man, Thor, Vision, T'Challa's Black Panther, Scarlet Witch, Sam Wilson's Captain America with the wings and everything, and the OP powerhouse of the group herself, Captain Marvel. Now, obviously, we're missing a few key players here, namely the non-powered powerhouses, those being Hawkeye and Black Widow. Also, the OG Cap is missing, who's actually still alive in this narrative. And also, most notably, our big green boy is missing. Now, it seems like the theme here seems to be only heroes who can fly are allowed into this club, with the exception of T'Challa, who's got his own bat planes. Panther planes? Anywho, even though we're missing the green Goliath this time around, we still got all kinds of muscle with this Avengers lineup. If you're enjoying the video so far, please support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. It helps us get our video boosted to the algorithm, get seen by more people, and just all around, this is a nice thing to do, so go ahead, do that. At number 8 are the Super Twins. Meet Ortho Ra and Oozle Ra, descendants of an offshoot of Kryptonians called Thelogians. Hope I said that right. Now these siblings had a tough start. See, the Philogians were already an alienated race, having been exiled from Krypton and settling on a new homeworld called New Philosia. Now, sometime later, their folks and older brother, let's say, got eliminated when World World attacked the planet, leaving the twins enslaved and isolated from their family. Now, life got really tough for them after that. 
They wound up living in cells under an arena, part of a race enslaved by Warzoon culture. The warlord culture had brainwashed them into thinking that cruelty was strength and kindness was weakness, but now things took a turn when Mongol, the big boss, ordered the two siblings to fight each other to the death. Now they refused, but luckily enough, Superman swooped in to save the day, long story short, teaching them that real strength comes from protecting others. Now after a crazy breakout and some heroic deeds, eventually they landed on Earth where Lois Lane and Clark Kent took them in, and voila, these super twins were born. Life on Earth was a bit tricky, especially for Ortho, but they're learning the ropes and becoming quite the heroes. At number seven is the Maker's Council. Now, I know the Maker is typically seen as an evil Reed Richards, but the Maker's gang in this one has beef with Doctor Doom and Kang the Conqueror, so let's just say that this team is morally ambiguous, to say the least. I mean, the Maker here is pretty dark, but I mean, generally speaking, he's got humanity's best interest at heart, even if it comes at seriously grave cost. Anywho, in this reality, the world is split into seven super states. And after conducting a variety of tests with iterations of experimental societies within his base of operations, the Maker grew convinced that enduring peace on Earth was unattainable due to, due to humans' inherent nature. Yeah, I get it, dude. We're all a bunch of monkeys. As a result, he established a secret council composing of the leaders of each of the seven territories, and together, they manipulated conflicts and alliances among their nations to unite their respective populations. So in the present day, the Eurasian Republic served as the designated rogue state that unified the other territories as a common foe, with the intention for this role to be rotated between each territory over time. So basically, it's George Orwell's 1984, except instead of Big Brother, it's the Maker. Pretty bleak, but hey, I guess if peace is unattainable, then controlled everlasting war is the next best thing. I don't know. At number six is the 13. Back in the 1940s, these guys were a mix of good and bad guys doing some morally ambiguous things. But then, bam, time got all wonky thanks to Barry Allen and Dr. Manhattan messing around, and these 13 got wiped away from history. Now, lucky for them, the Time Masters stashed him away in these kind of snooze pods to keep him safe. But fast forward a little bit, and a dude named Per Degaton muddles things up again, and these pods go kaput. These 13 peeps pop back into history before everything's completely fixed. Now the kicker here is that eight of them were sidekicks to the OG heroes from the Golden Age. They got snatched up by Palminder and chucked onto, get this, Orphan Island, a place somehow stuck outside of regular time. Then there was some epic showdown shenanigans. They'd team up with Stargirl, Red Arrow, Our Man, and beat the bad guys. But since they can't go back home to their old tie lines, our man zaps them to the present, and they become the Young Justice Society. At number five are the Thunderbolts. Not to be confused with the original team put together by Baron Zemo, this new squad emerged after the Outer Circle got taken down. When Bucky Barnes, who got all the Outer Circle secrets, teamed up with the person called Contessa Valentina Algera de Fontaine, that's a name, but guess what? She wasn't the real one, she was actually a fake, and they decided to join forces and make a gang called the Thunderbolts to crush the Red Skull and his whole operation. The crew got bigger when they got on board the Destroyer and the Red Guardian for a mission to wreck Red Skull's base in Argentina. And long story short, they won, they took out the Red Skull's main body, and basically just wrecked the whole setup. At number four are the Super Kids. So the reason this team got together was because apparently they were too young to join the Teen Titans. It's definitely saying a lot. Now, their story is pretty wild. It all began when some bad guys tried to mess with time, trying to erase two of the core members, Animal Girl, Animal Girl, and the Flash Twins before they could become heroes. But guess what? backfired big time. Instead of erasing them, it brought them face to face with their future teammates, Robin and Superboy. And just like that, Super Kids were born. So let's break it down. We've got Animal Girl, also known as Maxine Baker with her animal powers. Then there's Jai West as Surge and Ivory West as Thunderheart, the speedy Flash twins. And of course, Robin and Superboy rounding out the squad. At number three is the Spider Society. There was no way I was going to make a video about new superhero teams without bringing up an an entire collection of my favorite hero from across the multiverse, which made its debut in this year's Across the Spider-Verse movie. 
The Spider-Verse Society is led by Miguel O'Hara, aka Spider-Man 2099, with this movie being his first cinematic debut. In fact, we got all kinds of Spider-Men who we were praying would make it to the big screen one day, from classics like Ben Reilly, Spider-Man's clone from the Clone Saga, to more obscure ones like Peter Parked Car. Love that. After surviving a universe-ending event, Miguel went around picking up Spideys from all over, their mission being to preserve the multiverse from any conceivable threat, all, con all convening at Spider HQ on Earth 928, to which they travel to using their trusty little dimension-hopping watches. Cause Spidey's a genius, don't forget. At number two is the Blood Syndicate. The Blood Syndicate, made up of former gang members from Dakota City, is no ordinary super team. They banded together to take down a menacing villain and then protect their turf, Paris Island. Each member had their own rough past, hailing from different gangs and areas of the city. But when this villain threatened to rule the criminal underworld with violence, these superhumans united against him. In their first standoff, the Blood Syndicate really did not did not do justice. They fought individually instead of working as a team, leading to their quick defeat and separation. However, Flashback, one of their own, took a bold step at traveling back in time to warn them about their impending loss. Now with this crucial knowledge, the Syndicate regrouped, launching a fierce coordinated attack. And this time, they fought as a team, leaving well, the villain defenseless. Fate immobilized him and Tech-9 delivered the final blow, putting an end to the threat once and for all. And coming in at number one are the Dark X-Men, who are back again this year. Madeline Pryor's new Dark X-Men are about to show no mercy, and it's gotta be awesome. Along with the Goblin Queen herself, we've also got Maggot, Archangel, Gambit, Gimmick, Azrael, M-Plate, Zero, and Havoc. Basically a dream team of the X-Men's most lethal heroes. So after the massive party called the Hellfire Gala, Madeline Pryor, who's got some history with the X-Men, leads this new strike team featuring some prominent OG X-Men members like Havoc and Gambit who are back, but they've never teamed up like this before under such dire circumstances. Now without giving too much away, this team is set to be among the X-Men's brutal incarnations. I mean, just look at the opening sequence of the first issue of this comic series with Madeline Pryor envisioning her global takeover. I, it, it's dark. To say it's dark is an understatement. At number 10 are the New Warriors. By the way, all of my entries today are suggested by you guys in the comments, so this one was suggested by Kevin Murray 8803 and TND Atkinson, so thank you both. The New Warriors were a cool gang of teenage superheroes in the 90s who aren't super well known despite literally being the catalyst for the events of Civil War. See, in Marvel, teen teams aren't as common as in some other superhero universes, especially if they're not made up of mutants. But the New Warriors stood out. They had Night Thrasher, Nova, Speedball, Namorita, Marvel Boy slash Justice, Firestar, Rage, and the Silhouette, a bunch of powerful teens doing superhero stuff. People liked them a lot at first. The team had a bunch of awesome characters with unique powers, but later on, things didn't go super well for them. They tried to reboot the group as teen superheroes shooting a reality TV show. The reality show incarnation of the team was the catalyst in the superhero civil war because in a battle with a group of supervillains while filming season two of their TV show, the supervillain Nitro exploded, unaliving most of the team and hundreds of civilians. This was the event that ignited the Superhero Restriction Act and pitted heroes against each other, and in turn paving the way for the Skrull's secret invasion. At number 9 is the Justice Machine. Thank you to Carbon Dragon for suggesting this one. The Justice Machine is the superhero group of elite law enforcement from another world, Giorwell, which initially sounds like this futuristic all-tech wonderland, kind of like Star Trek vibes. But if the name of the planet didn't sound any alarms, it's probably because you haven't read any George Orwell. Well. No, Orwell didn't write this comic, but the world of Jorwell, which is initially presented as a utopia, actually takes a lot of inspiration from Orwell's 1984 novel. Think maximum government control, surveillance, and all kinds of propaganda. So after the team does a mission on Earth and learns what actual freedom is like, they start to second guess and realize that they've actually been working for the bad guys all along. Now we've got Challenger the leader, kind of like a Captain America type of strategist despite his declining age. Then there's Blazer, which got flames in flight, Titan who can grow 30 feet tall, Diviner with this freaky digital mind connection thing, and she's also Challenger's ex. We got Tailsman who's altering luck and probability, and lastly Demon, who's a martial arts and acrobatics expert. Pretty top notch team. If you're enjoying the video, 
video so far, please support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing the notification bell. At number 8 are the Champions of Los Angeles, suggested by Rodney Lindsay 849 For a Marvel team I've never heard of, this team is stupendously stacked. Like, even the Avengers ain't got nothing on the Champions of LA. Just check out this roster, okay? We've got Black Widow, Angel, Hercules, Ghost Rider, and freaking Iceman. Are you kidding me? That's like the fantasy superhero dream team right there. Like seriously, these guys together are no joke. Hell, the first baddie they took on, and thus the reason for their collaboration in their first place, was to team up against Pluto, the literal Greek god of death. Like Pluto! Seriously, the OG Avengers initially teamed up to fight the Hulk and then Loki, so to say that this team isn't at least on par with the Avengers would be doing them a great disservice. Literally the only thing this team is missing is a Spider-Man. At number 7 is the Legion of Substitute Heroes. Recommended by Bob Mathis Friedman 6742 and Aaron Malver 7452. These dudes were not the A-team but the backup squad called the Legion of Substitute Heroes which are a coalition of heroes who had been rejected from joining the Legion of Superheroes because their powers just didn't quite cut it. We're talking Polar Boy, Night Girl, Stone Boy, Fire Lad, and Chlorophyll Kid. Some kind of lame names, but they've all got some unique and probably uh, not so flashy abilities. Now, rejected but determined, they decided to form their own superhuman team. The group of rejects were finally able to prove themselves when Planet Man invaded Earth as the main legion was off in space fighting against robot ships. These underdogs stepped in and saved the day, stopping the Planet Man invasion. And as it turns out, Captain Freeze had been behind all of this using the androids and the Planet Man to overwhelm and distract the legion while he tried to steal the mighty shrink ray. Now Night Girl caught him in the act and that plant went poot. Despite starting undercover, the sub eventually got props from the real Legion. Sometimes being the backup team isn't so bad as they prove themselves as legit heroes. At number 6 is the Cyber Force. Thank you to Kevin Murray 8803 again. This comic book showcased a group of mutants who faced off against Cyber Data, a massive corporation aiming for world domination. See, the mutants were once captive to Cyber Data and underwent experiments that gave them enhanced powers using cybernetic implants. When they broke free, they formed Cyberforce to thwart Cyberdata's evil plans. However, the Cyberforce comics faced criticisms for their similarities to Marvel characters like Cyberblade's resemblance to Psylocke from the X-Men, for instance. Some readers also complained about the excessive violence and the portrayal of female characters, but despite these setbacks, Cyberforce tried to carve its place in the comic world, but gradually faded into obscurity. At number 5 is Cyforce. Thank you to the one ZN 1BD for this suggestion. Psy Force from Marvel Comics' new universe series revolved around youngsters affected by the white event that triggered paranormal abilities. Now, unlike typical superhero teams, these individuals lacked matching costumes but faced similar challenges of being different to persecuted, kind of like the X Men. Led by a CIA telepath, Psy Force's members struggled with internal conflicts but united in times of need. They resonated with readers due to their relatable struggles and the absence of coordinated outfits, breaking away from the norm of superhero teams. Unique to Cyforce was their ability to form a powerful being, the Cyhawk, by combining their powers. This amalgamation significantly amped their individual abilities, showcasing their strength when working together. Despite their differences, these youths banded together, which is definitely necessary seeing as their Hail Mary Hawk thing relies on their teamwork. At number 4 are the Lady Liberators. Thank you to Daniel Streeper 2318 for this one. The Lady Liberators are a fantastic bunch debuting in Avengers number 83. They've got Scarlet Witch, the Wasp, Black Widow, Medusa, and they're led by Valkyrie slash the Enchantress, which is total girl power. They actually stood up to the Avengers, calling them male chauvinist pigs back in the 70s. This team was a beacon for fans of strong female characters, basically the OG A-Force. It's like assembling the ultimate squad of heroines. These characters together packed a serious punch, and with their personality, they brought their own special skills to the table. They weren't afraid to challenge the status quo and fight for equality. At number three are the Great Lakes Avengers. Thank you to Bob Marthus Friedman again for this one. The Great Lakes Avengers, aka the Lightning Rods or the Champions, is a Marvel team formed by Mr. Immortal who realized at one point that he couldn't perish away. He decided more heroes would help, so he found folks like Dinosaur, Big Bertha, Flatman, and Doorman. They also rejected Leather Boy because he didn't really have any powers, just a thing for Leather Boy. Anyway, this team was mostly used for comedy relief in the comics as they weren't really taken seriously, but still managed to beat big baddies like Maelstrom and Gravitron. They're basically like the super team 
theme version of Squirrel Girl, mostly used for comic relief yet insanely overpowered and underrated. Which I guess is why it made total sense for Squirrel Girl to eventually join the team, albeit only for a little while, because after single-handedly taking down huge villains like Doctor Doom and Thanos off panel, she split the team because she got lazy playing cards instead of fighting. At one point, even Deadpool hopped into this team, but he eventually got the boot because he was too annoying. Which honestly is probably one of the main reasons Deadpool doesn't stick around with any superhero team for long. At number two are the Creature Commandos, suggested by Glenn Morgan Fan. 9411. These guys were once quite obscure, but they're back on track to becoming mainstream again thanks to James Gunn spearheading the animated series in the new DCU. These guys were a freaky team assembled during World War II by the US to scare the pants off the enemy, literally. It's basically a bunch of Universal's classic monsters mixed with superheroes. Frankenstein, the Bride of Frankenstein, and other spooky beings are a part of this bizarre squad. In the DC Comics world, these creatures were reimagined as a team fighting in the war. The gang includes Lieutenant Shreve, the leader, and a human among the monsters. Then there's the Boogeyman, a creature like the one in the Black Lagoon, and Dr. Medusa, whose name speaks for itself. But it doesn't end there. They also recruited a zombie, a dude powered by futuristic tech, and even a mummy. Yeah, they're quite a lot more eerie than their usual superhero bunch. And coming in at number one is the Power Pack. Recommended by Jonathan Pardo 6549 Thank you very much for your suggestion. Power Pack isn't your average superhero team. It consists of four siblings, Alex, Julie, Jack, and Katie, who all stumbled into their powers after their physicist father's invention attract the attention of battling alien races. It's pretty badass. These kids, gifted unique abilities by a dying alien, fought off evil snarks to save Earth, all while keeping their newfound powers a secret from their parents. Their adventures were guided by Friday, a super smart ship given by the same alien who granted their powers. At one point, even Franklin Richards, the son of Sue Storm and Reed Richards from the Fantastic Four, also joined the ranks, seeking a different life away from his super powered family. Now what's cool is that unlike other teen teams like the X-Men, the Power Pack completely lacked an adult mentor, which proved to create a super unique dynamic. Each sibling possessed distinct powers from gravity manipulation to high speed flight, molecular density control, and energy absorption. Power Pack's influence birthed a slew of young Marvel heroes, but their return is eagerly awaited to see how they blend in with the new teen heroes in Marvel's universe.